Hey, I have the privilege of taking a few minutes and just talking about a very important topic of generosity and fear. You know, over the years, I've come to believe that one of the chief enemies of generosity isn't necessarily greed, though that might play a role, but often the enemy of generosity is anxiety about tomorrow. Because let's just face it, whenever we give money away in sacrificial quantities, it's no longer ours. It's no longer ours to save. It's no longer ours for the future. And so God will begin to move in your heart to become a more generous, faithful giver. And then suddenly you hear some clunking beneath the floorboard of your car. And you wonder if the, it's the automobile pleading for a new transmission. Or that the, the stock market takes another hit. And with it, your retirement fund plummets. Or, or what if college tuition continues to rocket? And how do you know, how do you really know that you've squirreled enough money away for any eventuality, calamity, or emergency that can come your way? You see, there it is right there. Generosity of today is crippled by fear of tomorrow. And and what God invites us into is what I'll call a cycle of trust or or a cycle of care. It's really both, where he says, listen, uh, as you give, I'll provide. As you give, I'll provide. As you give, I'll provide. Just do what I'm asking you to do, and I will meet your needs. Make no mistake about it, as we grow in generosity, it will require that we also grow in the journey of trust. So I just want to share with you three stories from different phases of our married life. Chris and I have been married for 30 years now and have been in ministry for 30 years. And uh, in my book, Satisfied, I write about these three eras. One is uh, when we're just starting out as newlyweds in ministry. The other one is uh, when we hit our mid-30s. And the other challenge is one we're experiencing now. So uh, let me begin. As a newlywed couple, we were 21 years old, graduated from Bible college, and we got a phone call uh, asking us to come to Ada Bible Church. It's a church we've served for the last 30 years, but back in the day, it was a congregation of a couple dozen people. Now, what they were able to pay me was microscopic, and Chris was working as a receptionist at the time, making little more than minimum wage. And yet, as we embraced that financial challenge, which was uh, earnings that were lower than the poverty line, I think I was prepared for that moment. I was somewhat prepared because my parents had been church planters. They lived by faith. I mean, they moved to the western states and would start churches in towns with very little Christian influence. And uh, dad would work part-time jobs. And then sometimes money would trickle in from supporting congregations. But those words of the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread, those were very real to my parents. That was not an abstraction. And so I was raised on these stories of not having money and God providing and having a financial need and God providing. So when I graduated from college and became a small church pastor, it's like my whole spiritual legacy had prepared me for this incredible opportunity of embracing a small struggling congregation and the financial shortage that would accompany it. So I was ready, but we weren't ready. Chris's dad, he was a successful insurance agent. She didn't begin attending church until late in high school. And so this whole idea of the journey of trust where you just follow God and wait for him to meet your needs, this was totally alien to her. And that was before I proposed to her that we begin to practice the discipline of tithing. (laughs) Tithing, it's the life discipline of living on 90% of your income, so that 10% of your income can be given away. Tithing is this life practice of restricting your purchases to 90% of what you're making, so that 10% is totally at God's disposal. And so I proposed to her as newlyweds that we do this, and she thought I was crazy. Now, the issue here was not that I was generous and Chris was not generous. The friends that know us well can testify that Chris has a far more generous spirit than I do. The the issue wasn't generosity, the issue was fear. And her anxiety about our financial future was not ill-founded. We were barely making ends meet as it was. How in the world were we gonna make ends meet if we started giving money away at a substantial percentage point? And yet God moved in her heart. Uh, I, I couldn't coerce her toward generosity, manipulate her toward generosity. 
this was something God had to do in her journey of trust. And she was able to say, okay, God, if this is the lifestyle you're calling us to, I will trust you. I'll trust that you provide. And God did provide. We testified that there was never a day when we needed food for our three children and we didn't have something to eat or we needed clothing and didn't have clothing. <laughs> there would always seem to be a few dollars to put in the gas tank to get to a meeting or church service or activity that we needed to go to. Now, we didn't have everything we desired. We didn't have everything we wanted. But God provided for our needs. He was faithful to provide for our needs and well into many of the luxuries of life. And that was the journey of trust in the years when we were starting out, the years of financial shortage, where trust competed with fear to see how we would follow our Lord. But as we moved into our mid-30s, we hit this second season. And this was the season I will just call, you know, gaining financial strength. That the church began to grow. And as the church began to grow, my income grew. Our youngest went off to school, and with that, Chris returns to work outside the home. And so, once again, we had two incomes. And yet, as we were able now to take uh, you know, affordable vacations and uh, drive more reliable vehicles, it felt like financially we were in the slow lane, and our friends were zipping past us. You, you know what I mean. More elaborate vacations, nicer homes, you know, newer cars. And this was a time in our mid-30s where we simply had to remember who we were. We had to remember that because Jesus had come and died for us and rescued us, we had to remember that our core identity was fixed, not in what we bought, but in who bought us. Our core identity was not established by what we owned, but who owned us, who purchased us. It was just that time to learn because of what Jesus did. I don't get my identity from my car. Man, I bring an identity to my car. <laughs> we don't get our identity from our house. We bring our new identity to our house. But this too was the issue of trust. Now, in our mid-30s, the financial issue did not revolve around not having enough. It revolved around not being enough. And again, God provided and met us there. And we moved through our 40s and now into our early 50s. And, and, and now we are in this season of financial stability. We've been very careful you know, not to uh, have credit card debt and to save money and to give faithfully and not simply to buy larger homes because we could afford the payment. And because of that, we now have something that we never had in the early days of marriage and ministry. We have savings, and I love my savings. I mean, I love earning interest and not paying interest. Seeing savings grow is enjoyable. No, it's not just enjoyable. Seeing savings grow is intoxicating. Can anyone see a new challenge on the horizon? And so it was a couple of years ago, I stood in front of our congregation. It was December. We had a building program going, and I was making a pitch for a special Christmas offering. And so I said, please, each one of you, set aside, uh, bring a gift in addition to your regular giving, above and beyond your normal offerings. Bring a sacrificial gift. And then I exited the platform, and that week and I, my Lord and I had to have a heart to heart. <laughs> It's kind of like, okay, Jeff, what gift do you intend to bring? And I'm going like, no, 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 no. I'm already giving a substantial part of my income to the church. It's kind of like, no, 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 no. Leaders don't ask people to do what they're unwilling to do themselves. You said above and beyond your normal giving. What gift will you bring above and beyond your normal giving? And it better not be a couple hundred dollars. And I'm going, why not? This is my savings, my precious savings. It's like, no, you said sacrificial gift. And where you and Chris are financially right now, a couple hundred dollars is not sacrificial. So what sacrificial gift will you give above and beyond your normal giving? I'm going, this is my savings. It's supposed to move forward and not go backward. It's like, well, what's this money for? Well, it's for stuff out there. You know, the, the, the unforeseen stuff. I mean, accidents, incidents, calamities that I want to be prepared for. I mean, and like, what if I reach age 73 and I'm no longer able to work because of my health? What if I haven't set enough money aside? Who's supposed to take care of me then? <laughs> and then it was like I received a whisper from the father that said, Jeff, I've got a question. Who took care of your parents 
when they were in those early years of ministry? Who took care of you when you were a child? And the obvious answer was you did. And as you and Chris were starting out at Ada Bible Church and your income was so small, who provided for you then? You did. And as you were moving through your 30s and the issue was not having enough, but it was not being enough, who provided your core identity? Who gave you strength when you were weak, wisdom when you were confused, and grace for each day? And the answer was you provided that too. And then the real question, who provides for you now? I do. <laughs> Let's try again. <laughs> who provides for you now? You do. Well, if I provided for your parents and I provided for you when your children were young, and if I provided for you when your 30s and 40s, can you trust that I will provide for you when you're 73? Is it possible that your greatest adventure of trust is not in your past, but in your future? Will you believe that I'm good and that I'm gracious and I'm generous and my heart is moved when my children trust me when they step out on faith? Will you trust that you're involved in a cycle of care where you give and I provide and you give and I provide and you give and I provide? Welcome. Welcome to the cycle of care. Welcome to the journey of trust. But trust will always be an adventure.